take domestic violence, for example. Unfortunately, the trend, they say that uh, DV has increased in the past five years. It continues to climb. And here's where it hits home. In Sydney, in the past two years, it's gone up in three particular areas of Sydney. Eastern suburbs, Blue Mountains, and the southwest of Sydney. It's increasing in our area. Sexual assault. In the past 10 years, there's been a 10% increase in sexual assault offences in New South Wales, particularly amongst women, particularly amongst child victims who report when they're an adult. I'll take pornography. The stats currently put it at 100% of males and 81% females aged 15 to 29 have been exposed. It's pretty scary. On average, males first are exposed when they're 13, females at 16. Consequences of this, uh, the research would say that it points to higher levels of dissatisfaction with our bodies, greater self-objectification, which is kind of like looking at ourselves as objects rather than as people, greater tolerance of sexual violence towards women, boys believing they have an absolute entitlement to sex, and girls feel like they have no alternative but to submit to the boys' demands, regardless of their own issues. Now, I know this stuff is shocking, and I don't like to start off with shock, but these things are worth acknowledging because these things are deeply wrong. These things are deeply wrong, and they're plaguing our society. It's everywhere, and it's sad, and it's shocking. And we've got to ask the question, well, how long can these things be tolerated? <coughs> Something needs to be done. God promises that one day he will make things right. At the end, when Jesus returns, this is the great promise from the scriptures, those who are guilty will face justice. And those who trust in Jesus will receive mercy. We will all come face to face with the living God one day and give an account for what we've done. How can we be certain of this? Well, think about who's someone that you trust. You trust them because of their track record. If they have kept their word to you every single time, it's fair to say that they will keep their word the next time. So when we come to the scriptures, God has kept his word every single time. Genesis 6 is the start of that track record where God says he'll put an end to sin, he will judge, and he will also save. That's the start of the track record. And you will see it through to its fruition when Jesus comes back. The pattern starts to emerge from here in the story of Noah. When we look at Noah, it's the centerpiece of the primeval history. So Genesis 1 to 11, primeval history. Noah takes up a large amount of chapters. It's the centerpiece. And it's here because, well, Noah points us to what will happen at the end. Jesus points us to Noah when he speaks of the final judgment. The Apostle Peter points us to Noah to remind us of what is coming. And though Genesis 6 was written long ago, it's here to remind us of what our future holds. The pattern shown here is a promise for the future. And so let's actually look at what this pattern is. You can sum it up in uh, three ways, but let's just start with the first one. First thing we see here is the sinfulness of humanity. So look here with me. There were two key issues at the time. So the key issues you can see in the orange, they revolved around sex and violence. If you look under the hood, NIV, it says that they married uh, any of them that they chose. That's in verse 2. Uh, verse 4 says when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. It's actually a little bit more forceful or explicit when you look under the hood. This is the literal translation. The sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took any or all that they chose. Verse 4 says, The sons of God came to the daughters of men and bore children. Sometimes in the Hebrew, it speaks a certain way. It's kind of like saying when a husband and wife is intimate, a husband knows his wife. They wouldn't say explicitly, but it's implied. And so here, the fact that these sons of God, they took and they came, what's actually happening here? Some translations would take this as marriage. Was it marriage between one man and one woman in God's good design? Well, possibly. 
Was this more along the lines of polygamy, adultery, or sexual violence? Unfortunately, from the context, it's actually more likely. Now, we might recall at that because we know that this is deeply wrong. But that's the fact of the matter right now. Ten generations since Adam, sin has multiplied. Sex and violence is everywhere. Rather than respecting and honoring each other as men and women made in God's image, it's now descended into violence. Rather than sex enjoyed between a man and a woman in the safety of marriage, it's now descended into polygamy and adultery. It's widespread. And it's no wonder, Genesis 6 also says in verse 5, every inclination of the human heart is evil all the time. Verse 11, just to reiterate one more time, the earth is corrupt and full of violence. It is a really, really bad time. This is way worse than Adam and Eve's time, and it's continuing to head further and further away from God's good design. Now, who are the people doing this? That's where we come to the green. You'll notice that there are some interesting phrases here, sons of God, daughters of humans, Nephilim. What's all that about? The sons of God might sound good, but they're the ones who are actually doing these things. Some people see them as fallen angels. Some people see them as early kings. Some people see them as descendants of Seth. Without going into all the details, I think the sons of God here is talking about the descendants of Seth, and the daughters of humans is talking about Cain's descendants. Here's the reasoning. When you look at the context before and after this, we're talking about people here. This is right after Genesis 4 and 5, which was talking about Cain's line and Seth's line. When you, if you remember to, uh, back then, lots and lots of people were born. Lots of, lots of humans. There's lots and lots of people by now. It's been spreading from generation to generation for 10 generations from Adam to Noah. So that's a bit before. And a bit after, well, if you look here in Genesis, verse 5, it emphasizes how wicked humans have become. We're talking about people here. We're talking about how evil people have become. They've not only multiplied in number, they've also multiplied in sin. I will concede those sons of God and daughters of man, it is an unusual way to describe them, but it makes the most sense of this passage, because it's people here who are culpable for their sin. They're the ones who sin and they stray from God's way more and more, and it's getting worse. Just for the curious, uh, who are the Nephilim? Uh, I haven't seen the Noah movie, but yes, there are, uh, some people think that they're giants. That actually comes from Numbers 13. That's the only other place that Nephilim are mentioned. And in Numbers 13, if you read it, it makes it sound like they're really huge because the people who are looking at them, they say that they feel like grasshoppers compared to them. That being said, the flood that would destroy uh, these Nephilim at the time flood destroys all, all humans at the time, except for all those in the ark. For what it's worth, uh, nafal is the Hebrew root. It actually means to fall. So Nephilim could be another way of saying fallen ones. You could say all humanity has fallen since Genesis, six, uh, Genesis 3. So this could just be another way of saying that uh, these are all the fallen humans between Adam and Noah, rather than a specific group of giants. Now that's all really interesting to think through, but don't miss the point. At the end of the day, the emphasis here is on how sinful humanity have become, whoever they are. Just like the messenger boy who witnesses perverse behavior within and the horrors of war and violence outside, humanity has now reached a new low. How does God feel about this? Another tricky thing in this passage. Next part, verse 6. It says, the Lord regretted that he made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. Now, that might surprise you. Hang on a minute, like, does God regret? Well, the answer here is yes, but how do we make sense of that? You know, I, when I was reading over this, and as I've been wrestling with this, I find it hard to take in. And I was, trying, I was just wondering, well, why is it hard to make sense of God regretting? This is why. 
when we think of regret, we regret because A, we've done something wrong, or B, if we knew more beforehand, we would not have done it. Yeah? Just think of it for a moment. When you regret doing something, it's usually because, well, if you knew beforehand, then you wouldn't have done it. If you had more info, you probably wouldn't have done it. Or you did something wrong and you regret it now. But here it's different with God. He doesn't do anything wrong. He is good. He always does what is right. And also, He knows. He knows those who are His. He knows the flood is going to happen. Nothing is outside of His knowledge. So what's happening here? What's the author trying to say? Well, if you picture the last time that you were truly sorry, when you regret what you've done, just think back for a moment and dwell on that feeling. Even in this past week, there have been things that I've said that I regret. In that moment, when you move past the anger and the frustration and that all subsides, feeling of sadness comes. That's the moment. That's what the author is trying to capture here. God is truly saddened at what is happening with his creation. When we're grieved and we yearn for comfort and encouragement, that's how God is feeling here. Towards humanity at the time. Now we might recall that that you know, human being asks, why did he create us anyway? God knew this, this was going to happen. We won't go into that in details, but TLDR to glorify Jesus. If you want to ask more questions, come to the stretch night. Uh, that's on the 19th of June, or we can chat after the service. But let's keep going. What does God do about it? It's hard, to, it's hard not to see that He brings justice here. And yeah, He brings the flood. The ark itself is an act of mercy. So let's look at that now. Big part of scripture here, but just in a, in a like summarized form, God, he shows mercy here. He uses the ark to save Noah, and you'll see here that there are details of the ark. Now that's not irrelevant info. We might skip over it, but it's not irrelevant, it's not random. It's here to show us the sheer size of this thing. It's here to show us how one man faithfully obeys his God for a lifetime. When you look at the measurements, it is big. Verse 15 to 16. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof and opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle and upper decks. So just for reference, Noah's ark is about twice the size of a manly ferry. Now, it's not huge like a P&O cruise, but it's not small either. The graphic here is roughly the scale. It's about 150 meters long, 15 meters high, 25 meters wide. It's three stories high. This is before the age of steel and modern machinery. We have giant oil tankers and cruise ships now, but back then this was handmade out of wood with ancient tools, one man. Why? Why is this here? Why am I bringing this up? Well, we're meant to see Noah's faithfulness. See verse 22. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. It's repeated again. Verse 5, chapter 7. Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Just dwell on this just for a little bit longer. He labors over a century, yet he stays faithful to God. He was 500 when Shem... Ham and Japheth were born. By the time the flood happens, Noah is 600. In other words, this could have taken him up to 100 years, if not even longer, if he started building this before his kids were in the picture. Not only that, there was no flood at the time. It would have been dry. That in itself is an act of faith and an act of trust. He hears God's word and he clings to it and he trusts God's word till the end. Uh, one commentator puts it this way, simply by being a boat builder in the desert, Noah displays his faith in the judgment and mercy of God. It would have required careful planning and engineering. Imagine the number of trees to cut down, the amount of planning 
cutting, sanding, joining the wooden beams together, all while the rest of his generation taunts him. Yet Noah trusts what God says and stays faithful. The equivalent for us is when Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Noah, he loves God, trusts God, and obeys him willingly and gladly to the end. It's just like how Enoch stands out amongst the ten generations, Noah stands out in his generation. Amongst the polygamy, the adultery, and the violence, it doesn't distract him, it doesn't divert him, it doesn't pervert him. He stands as a bright light amongst his sinful generation. Jesus is sinless. Let's be clear with that. But in terms of blamelessness, and as term, in terms of godliness, Noah is as righteous as any godly leader can be. And so well, what happens? God sends the flood. That's an act of judgment to this generation. You can see here in the next section. Everything perishes. Verse 21. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that moved along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. Everything perishes. We know that's God who is behind this. He said at the flood, that's in chapter 6, verse 17. But we can tell here that's also God who preserves those who are in the ark. You may have noticed that little detail there in verse 16. Then the Lord shut him in. God is clearly behind this in both bringing the judgment and showing mercy to Noah and his family. People will ask, well, was it a worldwide flood or a local flood? Let's just suspend judgment for a moment and just look at the passage again. It gets pretty high. Here's what we see. It rains for 40 days. That is at least a month. That's verse 17. The ark is lifted high above the earth. High mountains are covered. The peaks of the mountains are covered by about 7 meters. And the rain didn't stop there. Often when we think of the flood, we think 40 days. It actually continued for 150 days. That's about five months of non-stop rain. It was intense for the 40 days, but it continued for 150 days. And scriptures, the scriptures here, they repeatedly emphasize all the humans and the creatures, they were wiped out from the face of the earth. Several references in chapter 6, chapter 8, chapter 9. So you could say that this is a local flood if you read this as this is what Noah saw, kind of like from his viewpoint, if there was a big flood that happened in the Grand Canyon, yes, you could say, see it that way. But regardless of how you see it, either way, the scripture's emphasis for us is everything is wiped out. All humanity, all creatures, however big this flood is, it wipes out everything. And just for a little bit more background, some great flood happened in the ancient world. There's other accounts out there from the ancient Near Eastern times. Either way, there was some great flood that happened, and Genesis 6 would say everything was wiped out. It would have been huge. Only Noah and his family are left. Genesis 10 emphasizes it's from Noah's sons that the people of the whole earth are populated. So what are we meant to see and do from this part of scripture? The single biggest truth from here is, we see a pattern here. The pattern shown here is a promise for the future. 
God confronts us here with our sin. We see the sinfulness of humanity, which we share in their humanness. We share in their sinfulness as well. The fact that sexual assault is increasing in New South Wales in the past 10 years, DV on the increase in the Southwest in the past five years, pornography and all its consequences pervasive. There's more, but just as a few. It's not particularly new. Ever since Adam, sin and sex and violence continues to multiply. And God says he will put an end to it, a final end to it, when Jesus returns. In some ways, that's actually a comfort, thank God, because if we're left to live our own way, this is how it ends up. And we actually need Jesus and his way. How else will men and women live in such a way where we honor each other with respect? It's, we do that because we see each other as people in the image of God. We show everyone dignity and respect because they are in God's image. Living his way, I mean, as men and women, we exercise self-control, even when things might get heated at home. We know we need to regulate ourselves rather than become heated or to even descend into further depths with that way. Or as men and women, we know where to flee sexual immorality. You know, we might struggle, but we'll do our best to put porn to death and use our bodies to please God, because that's what the scriptures urge us to do. Jesus has a better way, and he will return. So don't be caught off guard. And to those here who don't follow Jesus, he wants you to hear this warning. Jesus warns us again and again in the scriptures. Here's just a few. In Luke 17, he says, just as it is in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man, when he is revealed. And he's talking about the final day when Jesus comes back. How does he want us to respond? He says later in that chapter, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. In other words, if you're going to try and save your own life in the coming judgment, you will lose it. You won't survive rely on your own efforts. But if you give your life to Jesus, you will be safe. You will be preserved in that final day. It's not only Jesus who speaks of this. The apostles speak of this. 2 Peter 3. This is a day of judgment. A day where the ungodly, those who don't follow God, and those who live in ungodliness, will be destroyed. Heavenly bodies will be destroyed. Dissolved, that's talking about the stars, the moon, those kind of things. And there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. This will all come when we don't expect it, but it will come. It's inevitable, but it's not inescapable. Give your life to Jesus and you will preserve it. Guaranteed from Scripture, guaranteed. God's Word promises you that is the truth. Don't take it lightly, don't get caught off guard. For those of us here who do follow Jesus, this is a sobering reminder of our future. And we're urged to grow and to go. We're urged to finish well. And we see Noah's faithfulness, his obedience to the end. He sticks with God. He trusts God. He obeys God's word unto the end. So in a similar kind of way, we're to look to Jesus' return, to keep sticking to his word. Keep clinging on to the promise that he will come back. He promises it will happen. Noah had to wait a long time for the flood to happen. For us, we need to keep waiting. Keep watching, keep waiting, keep trusting and obeying. What are we to do in the meantime? Well, the Apostle Peter would say, in light of this final day, Live a holy and godly life. Keep on waiting. Keep living to please God. Keep honoring Him. And keep sharing the gospel. You know, until then, it is a lifelong mission to go. And Jesus says, go and make disciples. You know, give 
You might know someone who you can invite to hear about Jesus. This is a reminder of what is coming. Sometimes we just get caught in the motions and we need the reminder. Actually, this is what our future holds. We need to bring people with us. Share the good news with as many people as we can. If you don't have someone that you can invite or talk to about Jesus, well, you can always pray for someone. Pray for opportunities. Pray for them. Pray for their salvation or opportunities to reconnect. This isn't just you know, a once-off thing or a seasonal thing. This is a lifelong thing. As we wait, as we trust, Jesus will come back. And as I look at our congregation here, God has done wonderful things amongst us already in these past number of years. We've seen people come to faith. How awesome is that? God is doing that work amongst us, and we have the privilege to be part of that. But in light of that, we're called to keep playing our part in bringing people to know Jesus. Here are some different ways, just to be concrete, in the next couple of months. Holiday Kids Club is coming up. Think of people that you can invite. It could be a school, um, your parent, it could be friends, your kids' friends. Invite them to Holiday Kids Club. Uh, there should be flyers. If not, ask Amy for the link. Registrations are happening very quickly. Invite them. These kids will hear the gospel at Holiday Kids Club. And that could even be a great time for the parents to reach out to the other parents because they'll be free because their kids will be in the Holiday Kids Club. That's what I'm planning to do. You could bring them to the next Christianity Explained. Uh, we're hoping to start one in July. Uh, that's where we get a small group of people together. Small is good because then everyone can get to talk and we'll get to look at, well, what does the Bible say about Jesus? It starts with Him. Let me know if you're interested in that or you're willing to uh, serve in that. We want to start one in July. Let me know if you're interested in organizing our next evangelistic hot pot night. Uh, we learned that we, last year we held one in summertime. It was about 40 degrees. That probably wasn't the best weather for it. It's probably more appropriate to have one in winter time. But yes, we're in winter now, so we need to start thinking and planning and inviting. Uh, we need help. But let me know if you're interested. Evangelistic pop up night, small Bible talk, short Bible talk. I think that would be a great opportunity to reach out. And last but not least, there's nothing stopping us from reaching out to people to say, hey, would you like to read the Bible with me? Would you like to meet Jesus? Would you like to one day? It may not be straight away, but it could be one day. We don't offer, it's less likely that someone will reach out to us. Better for us to reach out to them and see what happens. Genesis 6 reminds us and points forward to the final judgment to come. And let me close by reminding us from Jesus' words. He says, Just as it is in the days of Noah, so will it be when Jesus returns. Let's hear that warning. Heavenly Father, uh, we are uh, just humbly come before your word and humbly come before you once more. Uh, we are sorry for our sin and we grieve with you at the sinfulness of our humanity and the world around us. Father, we thank you for the promise of mercy for those who trust in you. And we ask that you may help us keep clinging on to these promises that you give us in Scripture waiting and hoping for this final day that is to come. And until then, help us to be faithful. Help us to keep growing as your disciples. And help us to keep sharing the good news and to be patient uh, but to keep persevering and bring more people to know you. Thank you for all the people that are serving in various ways and for the upcoming events and courses and just uh, for your people that are here at this church. We pray that you may use us as your instruments to bring the good news. To this generation, help us to keep working hard at that, to keep praying, to keep trusting you through all this, recognizing that you are good, you are in control.